And I think those are the kind of things that we're trying to advise you know, our clients coming out from China in the same token, you know, helping our U.S. business uh, going to China, make sure to adjust to the Chinese economy, to uh, the Chinese you know, business, rather than coming over and then saying that, well, we know exactly what we're doing from U.S. and we're going to do exactly the same to your country. That's not going to work. So you heard it first. Uh, Southern California is the next uh, Shenzhen. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but we hope that we're going to create as many jobs as possible so that we can get the unemployment rate down to single digit. You know, that, would, that would be encouraging. Um, Pin, uh, l l let's just talk a little bit about, because you um, straddle uh, both of these large economies. Uh, clearly, there have been, and there's been a lot of uh, uh, reports in, in the press about this, uh, a big focus on the part of China to boost wages at the, the low end of the pay scale uh, in, in the mainland. Uh, I've, I've studied this myself, and um, it, it seems to be not a shocking development, but a conscious and deliberate aspect of government policy to uh, boost uh, worker income, especially at the low end, to address many of the, um, uh, the issues that um, uh, are viewed as impediments to uh, what China refers to as the harmonious society. Uh, do, do you see the, the era of low-cost Chinese labor really coming to an end that would uh, cause problems for uh, companies like, like Lu, who, who, who take advantage of uh, low production costs uh, to, to build uh, global products? Yeah, uh, there's a, one is a fundamental issue. The ultimate goal for the economic development is for the welfare of the society. So whether it's the goal or whether it's the process, whether it's uh, the option, I think you know the income increase in China is definitely there. And it, it, it will be there in the next 10, 20, or maybe forever. So that will definitely shrink the gap on the cost benefit, the labor cost benefit. So from that perspective, and I was joking with our chairman. I said, no matter how good we do here, if we cannot beat the currency change, when they convert back the USA profit into Chinese profit, now I'm in the negative right away. So it, so it, it, it is a matter of the process. But on the other side, as long as you have two different structures, I mean, labor is one side of the coin, and there's many different sides as well. As long as you have two different structures, then you will see the difference. As long as there's difference, now you have a value creation. So we're not really worried about that much, because you know, if the labor cost issue is, is gone, then we can look at others. For example, the, uh, the market in China, the, the technology difference. We bought a company last year here. We took them to China. And uh, all the OEMs uh, sort of uh, you know, blame on us and they say, how come you didn't bring this guy here sooner? <laughs> we needed the product. We need to you know, improve ourselves. You know, when people get more money, they want to have a better car. They want a more safety-related item. We, they want to be electronic. So all of a sudden, the resources here now we can take them back. Again, we're still the matchmaker. It's diff just different kind of match. So, you know, the challenge in the business is always there, you know. Uh, I don't think that's going to be the issue. The issue is whether we can really face the challenge, identify our strengths, and then maximize the benefit as we can take from both sides. No, that's very well put. Uh, Lou, in terms of the way you look at managing your global production platform. Uh, do you think this is a lot of hyperbole that the era of low-cost Chinese labor, low-cost Chinese production is coming to an end that um, uh, production <coughs> facilities are going to move, um, well, maybe not back to the U.S., but to Vietnam, Malaysia, elsewhere uh, in uh, uh, the region or, or South America or Eastern and Central Europe? What, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, first, as um, Dominic said earlier, uh, when you look at a um, 
completed item, there's many different components. There's, uh, there's the raw materials. Uh, the, um, there are the, in, in our case, uh, there's the leather, the fabric, the hardware, the trim, and so forth. And most of those items uh, uh, come from uh, countries outside of, of China. We have a global purchase uh, purchasing capability. When we look at labor as a component of total cost, on, on our labor, including overhead and profit, is about, uh, is about 25 to 30 percent of the total good. So it's a, still a, a very small fraction, important, but a small fraction of the total uh, cost of the item. Uh, we, um, we are obviously um, uh, subject to the, um, to the uh, rapid um, wage increases that are occurring uh, in China among, uh, among uh, those um, employees, particularly who work within the manufacturing sector. Um, we're supportive of those increases um, in order to help um, them have an enhanced lifestyle. And one of the things we do is work with our factories to um, offset higher labor costs through improved efficiency, through both uh, technology, lean manufacturing, and, and we also look to counter source raw materials so we can offset um, um, some of the labor costs. At the same time, um, we are beginning um, to diversify uh, production out of China into uh, other Asian countries um, that, um, that um, are not enjoying the level of uh, prosperity that China uh, is enjoying today. Uh, countries uh, such as uh, India um, and um, Vietnam, as well as the uh, Philippines. So we do have a global sourcing base, and we do expect over the next four to five years to <coughs> migrate um, 40 to 50 percent of our production outside of China. All right, we've got some fantastic uh, questions here, um, and, and um, I, I think we'll, we'll, we'll go to the, uh, uh, the questions, and I would urge you to keep uh, write, writing these questions, uh, and they very much uh, flow from the discussion that we've been having uh, here. Uh, let, let me uh, lob the first one to you, Dominic, because you're now uh, uh, next year, you're going to be given the opening uh, speech here, and I'm sure you were taking mm -hmm. notes on, on what you heard uh, earlier. But but what what is, is the incoming chairman of the the committee of 100? What 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 do you see uh, your your role is going to be here in in promoting improvements in U.S.-China relations uh, over the, uh, the the next several years? Well, I think that will be pretty consistent than what our, you know, uh, past chairs have done. That is that we will continue to focus in on our dual mission, which is, you know, fostering a better U.S.-China relationship and, uh, and by providing conference such as this to highlight some of the issues that uh, clearly, you know, that we think that the public uh, we very much needed to have better information about and better understanding about what's happening between U.S. and China. And be constructive. Be constructive. Because there are too many people in this world uh, for personal agenda purposes, you know, whether it's a specific politician who need vote to uh, come up with, you know, uh, maybe malicious, you know, type of uh, commercial that, that are unconstructive to the betterment of uh, promoting U.S.-China uh, trade relationship and so forth. I think that uh, members like Committee 100 need to work together with plenty others, actually plenty others in the United States who very much would like to have a constructive working relationship between U.S. and China. And the reality is that uh, U.S. cannot do without China, neither do China. And uh, we're in a global economy, you know, we, we're connected not only because of the business reason, but we're connected politically, you know, U.S. and China need to deal with Iran, North Korea together. Uh, U.S. and China need to deal with environmental issues in this world together. And U.S. and China obviously want to solve each other's financial issues. And so 
That's what Committee 100 would like to do. We cannot solve this world's problem. We cannot solve all the U.S.-China major issue. Ultimately, it's still President Obama or whoever is going to be the president after 2012.